Hello everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today on non-adherence and its management in early core psychotic disorders. Dr. Macheri Keshvan will be discussing the causes of non-adherence and approaches to identifying and managing non-adherence in patients in the early course of psychotic disorders. I will be turning things over to him shortly, but first I'd like to review a few housekeeping items with you all. Please remember to mute your computer speakers if you are calling in via phone. The computer speakers can be muted through Adobe Connect by pressing on the green horn above the presenter's pod. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later time on the MHTTC website. The PowerPoint slides and any additional resources discussed today will be available later today as well. During the presentation, if you have any technical difficulties or questions about the topic, you can use the chat and questions box down on the bottom left. Those attending today's live event will be eligible to request a certificate. More information regarding the CEUs will be in a post-webinar follow-up email. To reach us after the webinar, you can email newengland at mhttcnetwork.org. Our MHTTC's mission is to use evidence-based means to disseminate evidence-based practices across New England. Our area of focus is geared towards recovery through recovery-oriented practices and support services within the context of recovery-oriented systems of care. To ensure the responsiveness of our work, we will actively develop and maintain a network composed of different stakeholders from each of the six states to guide our activities. To learn more about us, you can visit our website as well. With that, it's my pleasure to announce our speaker today, Dr. Macheri Keshavan. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I appreciate MHTTC giving me an opportunity to cover this topic of treatment adherence in psychotic disorders, which is a very important clinical topic, even though I will be focusing on psychotic disorders, um, the principles that I will discuss would be broadly applicable to all of serious mental illness. And I'll be discussing about the causes for non-adherence as well as approaches to manage non-adherence in people with serious mental illness. So first, uh, it would be um, good to think about what terminology we use in terms of um, in terms of compliance, adherence, and, and so forth. By and large, the common term that is used is treatment compliance. Even though many people um, do not like this term because it implies as though there is a doctor who has to give an order and the patient has to comply with it. And that is a little bit of an unequal equilibrium which uh, is not exactly optimal as a language to use. Uh, an alternative is treatment adherence, which is a little bit better, but still there is the belief and expectation that is implied here that the patient would adhere to a prescribed treatment and um, would not entirely be consistent with the principle of um, collaboration and shared decision making and so forth. However, I'm going to use this term more commonly because that is the widely used term in the literature and in practice. The other terms that include treatment interest, which is not exactly very uh, adequate because patients might come and say, Doc, I'm interested in your treatment, but uh, you know you take it, I don't want to take it, and so forth. So that's not ideal. Uh, a good term to use is treatment alliance. It's a broad term that uh, signifies uh, the relationship between the clinician and the patient. And any treatment has to happen in the context of a positive, effective therapeutic alliance. But the more uh, relevant point for what I'm going to be talking today is about is something that is not just therapeutic alliance, but also a collaboration or the adherence to the treatment that is prescribed. Hello, Kesh. 
Yeah. I'm so sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but we're having um, participants say that the audio is very low. Is it possible for you to bring the phone closer to me, please? Okay, I'm moving it right now. Thank very you so much. To where I am. Is this any better? Is this any better now? Yes, participants are saying it's much better, so I think that's good. Yeah, I apologize. Thank you for, so much. So again, while this slide is still on, the main point of this slide is that there is no good terminology for treatment compliance. Compliance itself is a little bit unsatisfactory because, because it implies that there is an unequal doctor-patient relationship with the doctor giving the orders. Treatment adherence is a little bit better but still implies that the patient has to adhere to a prescribed regime. Treatment alliance and treatment interest are alternative options, but in practice, mostly we use the term therapeutic adherence. So moving on to the next slide, um, this is just a slide to kind of uh, get people thinking about uh, what does it involve. What does treatment adherence involve? So here is a cartoon. How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Many of you may have seen this cartoon. The answer is, sorry, uh, how do I go back here? Um, The answer is just one, but the bulb will have to be willing to change. So that really puts uh, the whole perspective into the context of insight that the uh, patient has uh, or does not have about the illness, which um, really is a central element in compliance. But the main point that I also want to make is that insight is not necessarily the same as treatment compliance or treatment adherence. They're highly correlated, but they're not the same. For example, there are many patients who have good insight but do, do not follow the prescribed treatment. And there are many patients who are quite compliant with treatment, quite adherent, uh, but do not have insight. So they are highly correlated, but are not necessarily the same. That's the main point here. The other important point is that poor insight in this illness, which sets in the stage for poor treatment adherence, is something that begins quite early in illness. In fact, it is almost a um, quintessential component of psychosis. You don't say anyone has psychosis unless they have lost insight at some point. So insight is very, very critical, and which is the reason why people with psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia almost 100% of them have poor insight at some point or the other, and therefore um, poor adherence is extremely common in people with psychiatric illness. This is uh, a cartoon of uh, Emil Kraepelin, the father of psychiatry, who said that understanding of the disease disappears fairly rapidly as the malady progresses in the overwhelming majority of individuals. Another important aspect of uh, Insight into illness that uh, one needs to keep in mind is that insight is not one thing. Insight is multidimensional. For example, one aspect of insight is the awareness that there is a uh, pathological uh, experience or behavior. So, for example, you know, the person might know uh, or may, might not know that uh, a given experience of hearing voices is because of a illness versus the belief that it is actually someone talking out there, even though there is nobody out there. So first of all, there has got to be an awareness of a given experience as being due to an illness. That is one part of it. A loss of awareness is, also, is called misawareness. But on the other hand, there may be some people who are aware that the experience is pathological. They should not be having that experience, but still they attribute it to a um, delusional or a, 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 an unrealistic uh, explanation. For example, I know I shouldn't be hearing these voices, um, but uh, 
you know, these are these look like they're not coming from my head, but uh, there is a computer chip in my head that is generating these voices. So this is a misattribution. So the person is aware that there is a hallucination, but he is attributing that to a uh, chip in the in the implanted in the head. That's the second component of insight. The third component of insight is the person may be aware of the experience of hallucination and may correctly attribute it to the illness. I have, I hear these voices, I know it is due to schizophrenia, but I don't need help. So that is the third part. That is the appreciation or acceptance of a need for help. The fourth component is, you know, the person may say, I do hear voices, I know it is due to schizophrenia, I know I need help, but I don't like this treatment. I'm not going to accept your treatment for one reason or the other. And that is the adherence, part of the, the, the actual compliance with the treatment. So these are the four elements of insight. And many people have one or more aspects of these uh, um, dimensions of insight that are abnormal, uh, not necessarily all of them. So we need to address each one of them as we um, approach treatment. Now, what causes poor insight? Uh, one observation that has been replicated frequently in the literature and that goes back to one of our own studies uh, several years ago is that those with uh, cognitive impairments tend to have worse insight. More cognitively impaired a person is due to schizophrenia, the worse is the insight. And why might that be? So that raises the question as to what is the cause for poor insight. And many people in the last century uh, argued that poor insight in serious mental illness is because they are in denial. They, um, they are consciously or unconsciously suppressing the fact that they have an illness and denying it. But increasingly, research is showing that poor insight may be due to a brain dysfunction. And there is a condition um, in neurology called anosognosia. Anosognosia is defined as the inability to recognize or detect a disorder that is clinically evident. Many people with uh, neurological disorders like uh, stroke, for example, especially if it is a right-sided stroke affecting the right side brain, right, uh, right side of the brain, causing a left-sided paralysis and so forth, they classically tend to deny that they ever have a paralysis on the left side. They argue with the doctors that they don't have any problem with their left arm or leg. And they behave as though they don't have any problem. That is because the part of the brain that reflects upon itself, the part of the brain that observes itself, which is typically in the right cerebral cortex, if that is impaired, there is an uh, inability to recognize one's own illness. That is called anosognosia. And many investigators have argued that what you see in schizophrenia and other serious mental disorders is a kind of anosognosia. And people have actually looked at the question whether brain dysfunction is related to poor insight. And indeed, observations have shown, research has shown that those who have poor insight actually have some brain dysfunction, especially in the prefrontal cortex more so on the right side in our own research. And so, first of all, insight is multidimensional, we talked about, and secondly, it is uh, the awareness of the illness is related to cognitive impairment, and these cognitive impairments might have an origin in brain dysfunction. Let's now talk about um, compliance or adherence, um, how common it is. 
and increasingly it is recognized that in, uh, adherence or compliance is not one thing. There are varying degrees of non-adherence or non-compliance. There are people who are 100% um, adherent to the prescribed treatment, and there are those who are 100% uh, non-adherent. Those are the extremes, but the majority of people fall somewhere in between. The um, continue, there is a continuum of non-compliance in the population of people with serious mental illness. So one can define how much non-compliance is clinically significant and so forth. By and large, you know, if the patients are not taking or accepting treatment or not coming to treatment more than half the time or more than three-fourths of the time, depending on an arbitrary def definition, that would be considered non-adherence or non-compliance. Why is it important to study non-adherence? It's important because non-adherence to treatment is the strongest known cause for relapse, um, the treatment. And also, the studies have shown that each time a patient relapses, it takes longer to get the person back into being stable. For example, a study done by Jeff Lieberman in the 1990s showed that it might take about 50 days to stabilize the person after the first relapse, about 100 days after the second relapse, and about 150 days after the third relapse of a, um, of a psychotic illness. So it is important to predict relapses. It's important to monitor non-adherence. And it's important to intervene early so that we prevent as many uh, relapses from the first psychotic episode itself. Now, how common uh, is non-adherence across various medical and psychiatric disorders? Are serious mental illnesses more likely than medical illnesses to cause non-adherence, or is it less likely to cause non-adherence? It depends. As this slide would show, um, as I go through here with this animation, weight reduction is probably the most likely um, aspect of health management and health care that people are likely to be non-compliant with, almost 100 percent or 90 plus percent. The second is schizophrenia. The third is exercise. Fourth, fourth is flossing. This is in one study. Hypertension, then diabetes, depression, or rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, strep throat, headaches, migraines, for example, and OCD, which is not in this slide, tends to have higher levels of compliance. Of course, you know, they're obsessive about taking their medications, and so you would expect some psychiatric disorders to be associated with more non-compliance and some with less non-compliance. But in schizophrenia, as we'll see later, um, over 80% of people, or nearly 80% of the people, are not taking their medications at the end of a year and a half of uh, treatment, as one of the major studies showed, which I'll show you in one of the slides. Uh, this is the slide. In a major study that was done on treatment of schizophrenia by Jeff Lieberman, published in the early 2000s, what was found was that about three-fourths of the participant patients had discontinued their first prescribed medicine by 18 months of follow-up. So it's important to know that in psychiatric disorders, especially in schizophrenia, non-compliance is quite high, especially early on in the illness. Now, how do we measure non-compliance or non-adherence? There are several ways um, in which we measure non-adherence. One is, of course, to ask the clinician what they think, um, the, you know, the patient's uh, response to treatment and the, whether the patient is 
accepting medications or not and so forth. And then of course asking the patient is another important aspect. Many times we don't even ask. But if we do ask, the proportion might come down. And then the third option is uh, to actually monitor their medication taking behavior. There is a uh, system called medication monitoring system, electronic monitoring system called MEMS. So basically each time they open the bottle, it registers in the uh, bottle cap and when they come for their monthly visits to the doctors, they can um, use that cap to read out a recording of how many times uh, a day and how many times during the month they opened the bottle in order to take the pill. That's called the MEMS cap. The fourth way of monitoring adherence is to actually count the pills that are remaining in the bottle each time that the patient sees a clinician. And in this study, in the same clinic, when um, the clinician ratings were looked at, it was clinicians thought that 80% of the time the patients were taking their medications. But when they added a careful interview with the patient on their compliance, it came down to about 60%. And they actually measured the pill-taking behavior using the medication electronic monitoring system cap. It came down to 40%. When they actually counted the number of pills, it came down to 20%. So the main point here is that patients and clinicians estimate alone can be quite highly unreliable. So one may need to use multiple ways of uh, ascertaining uh, treatment compliance in our practice. Now, why do people either accept and take medicines as prescribed, or why don't they do that? And so, um, one can look at the number of causes for non-adherence, and we can categorize them in the form of treatment-related factors, person-related factors, and illness-related factors. So there is a theory called the health belief model. So those who believe that the medicine is good for them are likely to take the medicine. And if they don't believe that for one reason or the other it's not good for them, they are not likely to comply with the treatment. And the reason or the logic that they come to as to whether something is good for them or something is not good for them depends on the individual, depends on the treatment, and depends on the disease itself. So treatments that are actually effective and safe and simple to take and are inexpensive and that there is a good doctor-patient alliance or relationship and they are well supervised in their treatment. All of these factors increase treatment adherence. Likewise, at a person level, those who have good insight, those who have good family supports, and those who are intelligent and are aware of their um, treatment are more likely to comply with treatment. Also, in terms of the acceptance, those who accept the illness as an illness, those who perceive its severity and its consequences, and they are those that perceive the susceptibility to relapses in the absence of the medicine are all likely to enhance compliance. So by contrast to that, treatments that don't work, treatments that have side effects, treatments that are complex, expensive, and when the therapeutic alliance is bad, they're all likely to lead to non-compliance. Cultural barriers, family prejudice, poor insight, stigma about taking the illness can also uh, contribute to non-compliance. Sometimes non-adherence is because the symptoms have gone away. So being asymptomatic itself is a cause for non-compliance in many patients, especially if they do not perceive the fact that 
not taking the medication is likely to lead to relapse. Psychosis, continuing psychosis is a cause for non-compliance. Grandiosity, I can cure myself. I don't need anybody, that kind of a belief. And also cognitive impairment, as we will come to in the next several slides. So just to summarize that point, those um, patients in whom they view the medicines or treatments as more as disadvantages as opposed to benefits are li uh, likely to become non-compliant with the treatment. On the other hand, patients who perceive more benefits and less disadvantages are more likely to comply with treatment. So our goal in treatment should be to enhance the benefits and minimize the disadvantages of the treatments uh, that we offer to our patients. So in the next several slides, I'm going to take you through a number of clinical scenarios which will illustrate each of the key points that I have made so far. And I'll pause at the end of each of these uh, um, uh, summaries or case vignettes to give you some pause to think about what you might do in those situations. And then I'll tell you what, you know, what we would recommend, uh, what the best practice literature tells us, and I'm going to give you about six such case scenarios. So there are those patients who believe that they don't need the medications. These are the people who either have no, no insight or do not perceive a need for treatment. Then there are those who refuse medications. And then there are those who are non-compliant or non-adherent because the medicines are ineffective. Then there are those who are non-adherents because of side effects. Then there are those that simply don't show up for their treatment for one reason or the other. And then there are those who frequently miss or forget to take their medications. So these are kind of the six scenarios. And our approach to treatment compliance would differ for, for each of those. So this young man, all of these are patients that uh, were from my practice, but I have um, altered them sufficiently that there is no, um, you know, uh, no, no identifiability. This young man was admitted for not eating, declining grades, poor self-care, self and wandering the streets. He believes that he, she is not ill, um, and but admits to her thoughts being cluttered by whispering sounds. So here is an example of uh, poor insight, and uh, she doesn't believe she needs treatment. How would one approach this? So she came for, she came, went to a couple of different doctors, and then she came to us, and I saw her a couple of times, and I could not make much of a headway. So how, what approach did I take with her? So the approach I took with her is to explain to her, this was a young lady who uh, was a college student. She was studying electrical engineering, and uh, she believed that she was going to become a uh, messiah and uh, cure the world of problems, poverty, and, and so forth. Um, but she also was distressed by the fact that she couldn't concentrate in her classes, and, um, uh, and her mind was being cluttered. So I took the approach of explaining to her uh, that you know she was an electrical engineering student, and in her own words, I explained to her that her brain might be like a radio that um, she was describing to me how what happens if a radio is not working right. So either the radio doesn't pick up the right stations and would cause a lot of static because of noise. So she was talking about low signal and high noise being a problem. The signal noise ratio as an electrical engineer. So it was easy for her to understand that the brain could be an information processing machine. The fact that she could not concentrate in her classes was because of the low signal and the fact that she 
um, was having these fluttering thoughts due to whispering sounds in her head was due to the noise. And I explained to her that this kind of a low signal, high noise situation might be related to a dysfunction or an imbalance in the dopamine system in her brain and that if we corrected the dopaminergic system by a medicine that could increase her signal to noise ratio. The main point here is that I was able to develop a therapeutic alliance with her. Listening to her side of the story, she was concerned about the poor concentration um, and the inability to sit through classes. I listened to her. I uh, thought through her point of view. I developed a point of agreement without giving her necessarily a diagnosis that you have schizophrenia, but to kind of create a conceptual model that she was willing to understand that this could work by correcting that imbalance and improving her signal to noise ratio in the brain. And then we developed a partnership and I prescribed her some uh, aripiprazole which she took and she felt better. So the point here is that developing a therapeutic alliance, not necessarily um, you know, giving a diagnosis that they don't understand but explaining uh, the illness to them in their terms um, and identifying a problem that they and you both agree with. And that approach is called the LEAP approach, listen, empathize, agree, and partner. And uh, a, there is a classic book written by, um, by Xavier Amador. So how did I get to this? Sorry. Uh, okay. So um, that, uh, that uh, I'm trying to get moved to the next. Oh, that's very cool. Okay. Yeah, so there is a book that I would recommend you all to read, which is by Xavier Amador. It's called I Am Not Sick, I Don't Need Help. And he describes this LEAP approach quite nicely in that. So the second story is a young man who was admitted for odd behaviors of uh, trying to climb the high-rise building and to patrol the downtown of the city at night so that he can save lives. He does not believe he is ill and he refuses medications. It's uh, not an uncommon problem. Quite often we have to admit individuals like this because they're at danger, uh, risk for themselves or others. So how does one approach uh, treatment in someone like this who is refusing treatment? So the key issues again are listening, as I said before, to the patient's concerns and the goals of treatment. Um, educating them to the extent that they are willing to accept about the nature of their illness and the consequences of not treatment and the benefits of treatment. Identify and address the barriers to treatment adherence and uh, elicit support from the family if there is somebody else that they would listen to or a clinician that they have developed a positive therapeutic relationship. All of those would be important first elements. If they are still refusing treatment, one may need to get a second opinion for a compulsory medication only if the patient is a danger to self or others. And of course, in the outpatient setting, uh, in individuals who, are, who have poor insight and, and that are not accepting treatment, having a court order and assisted outpatient treatment, Rogers, those are the kinds of things that one would need to consider. There is another approach uh, that is used in uh, psychotherapy called motivational interviewing where, again, going back to what I said earlier, the patients are more likely to accept treatment if they believe that it helps them. And that decision they have to come to themselves by their own logic, logical thinking. And motivational interviewing takes the approach of helping the patients come to uh, evaluate the pros and cons of uh, alternative courses of action by inductive questioning, reflective listening, and regularly summarizing and exploring their ambivalence and uh, getting them to come up with a decision um, and reinforcing their own adaptive decisions, adaptive attitudes and behaviors. And that approach is called motivational interviewing, which has been used in, in patients with poor insight using an approach called compliance therapy or motivational interviewing therapy. And that actually can be effective 
in the treatment of uh, non-compliance uh, with uh, uh, treatment in serious, seriously mentally ill populations. The, however, the problem with um, compliance therapy or any other psychotherapeutic approaches can often be that if they don't come for the th therapeutic sessions, any treatment is likely to be ineffective. So uh, it's a bit of a catch-22. In order to benefit from psychotherapeutic approaches to non-adherence, you have to get them to come to the uh, treatments. So a judicious combination of pharmacological and medical treatment and individual psychotherapy and group approaches would be helpful. So here is another young man who was seen in the emergency room for recent paranoia and auditory hallucinations. He's prescribed two milligrams of risperidone from the emergency department and discharged. And he just drops out of the clinic. Um, but we also found that the day later, a day later, he had come to the emergency room um, believing that he had meningitis. So what turned out in this case was that he was seen with um, psychosis. He was given an antipsychotic, but he was not uh, alerted to the possibility that he might develop side effects. So what ended up happening was that he developed a extra pyramidal side effect with the antipsychotic um, that uh, led to the emergency room doctors the following day to think that he might have meningitis because he had his eye, his head going back, um, neck stiffness, which can be caused by antipsychotics. And the doctors who saw him did not uh, think of the possibility that this might be a side effect. So they thought he had meningitis and ended up doing a lumbar puncture and a lot of invasive tests. So he got totally fed up with the treatment and he dropped out of coming to see any doctors and ended up coming back a few months later with a very severe psychotic illness. So the main point here is that side effects could be a cause of non-adherence. So how does one address this? So the important point is to proactively evaluate for medication side effects. And explain to the patients that they might experience one or other side effect in order to prevent them from uh, getting the wrong treatment or inappropriate treatment. Educating them about the potential side effects and what to do if they appear. Um, what are the side effects that are likely to appear immediately and what are the ones that might emer emerge later? For example, uh, restlessness and um, you know, involuntary movements like the uh, eyeballs rolling up or head going back and so on, this which we call dystonic reactions, are likely to be immediate and they should be uh, informed of those so that they don't, they, they take the appropriate action. So going back to the clinician that uh, prescribed the treatment for them. And also, um, when you do see side effects, Adjusting the dose to the extent where there are no side effects or minimal side effects, if possible, would be an important step. Consider switching the medications. Um, so these are all the options to consider when uh, patients in whom the non-compliance is related to side effects. Of course, consider adding an agent to counteract the side effect. For example, giving an anti-Parkinsonian agent when they have a dystonic reaction. Um, or if it's diazepine for, uh, for restlessness and, and so forth. Sometimes economic side effects can be a big issue. And if we don't evaluate the cost of the medicine that you're prescribing, um, some, uh, the discontinuation of the treatment is, uh, is often due to simply the expense of the, so it's, you might call that an economic side effect. So this young man was treated with uh, lanzapine up to 40 milligrams a day 
for delusions that his family was replaced by replicas. It's a kind of a delusion called Capgras delusion, which uh, we sometimes see. And even though he was on a fairly large dose of uh, lanzapine, the, the treating resident during an evaluation was puzzled by why the patient had not put on any weight. So, you know, as, as uh, most people know, uh, drugs like olanzapine have a very high frequency of causing weight gain. And uh, so he was smart enough to figure out, you know, ask the question, why is he not putting on any weight? And what was happening was that he was not taking his medications simply because of, in, uh, of the uh, fact that the delusions were not going away with the olanzapine. So Capgras delusions are notoriously unresponsive to treatment. So when you have a patient who is non-compliant because of lack of efficacy, the approach to treatment is are different. So the options include check whether the patient is actually compliant or not. Recheck whether the diagnosis is right. Is there something you're missing, perhaps an organic brain disorder that is not responding to treatment? Is the dose adequate? Has the duration on medication been adequate? If not, would one consider an alternative strategy? Has an augmentation been considered, like adding a um, mood stabilizer um, or adding a second antipsychotic of a different pharmacological class? Or alternatively, has other medications been considered, like clozapine, for example, when other antipsychotics don't work, the standard antipsychotics don't work, clozapine does work, and so on. So lack of efficacy is an important cause for non-compliance to be considered. So this uh, young man was discharged from an inpatient unit on a Friday. On Monday, um, nurses noted that he forgot to take his follow-up instructions. He missed his appointment on Wednesday, but showed up a year later, later due to a severe psychotic decompensation. So what was happening here is that he simply did not get or follow up the appropriate instructions and connecting him up with an outpatient treatment. And so it's a healthcare system problem. So enhancing therapeutic continuity is very important. Consider sending, accessing the patient by phone, sending letters, improve social support services, evaluate barriers for treatment, uh, communication between inpatient and outpatient treatments. So healthcare access is an important issue to consider the continuity from inpatient to outpatient and making sure that there is, uh, the patients are well connected and they're made well aware of the approaches to care and the caregivers. So this uh, young lady, um, was um, treated with multiple medications, including um, clozapine, lithium, valproate, geodon, um, and also cogentin, uh, benzotropin. One day, the police are called midday to see if she does not have answer, does not answer the door. Our children are crying inside. So what happened here was that she was hyper compliant. She took her medicines, but because she was on so many medicines, her memory was impaired. And so she took them again, which is what led her to be almost unconscious and, you know, the police being caught. So keeping track of the prescription amounts and the expected refill dates, coordinating the information with the pharmacy, identifying barriers to taking medications, considering pill box, um, and also assessing compliance regularly via pill counts, plasma levels, and so forth would be important. There are a number of uh, tips that are useful in the enhancing compliance, medication being handled by another person like a family member, uh, keeping the medicines in a visually prominent place, like a, you know, like uh, next to the refrigerator, pill boxes, alarm watches that 
send an alarm each time the medicine is due, electronic caps, which we talked about, appointment reminders, phone calls, daily checklists, all of these could be helpful. Now, there are pharmacological approaches. I'll spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, the number of long-acting medications, um, both conventional antipsychotics and uh, atypical antipsychotics, including risperidone, lanzapine, paliperidone, aripiprazole, and also uh, plasma level monitoring, which is not widely available. Uh, there is a new medicine called aripiprazole mycite, which is approved by the FDA, which is a, uh, basically a, a, a digital pill. And as you see in this slide, uh, there is an electronic chip in the uh, an electronic uh, co component of the pill, which when it comes in contact with the stomach acid, uh, generates a signal which is picked up by a patch on the arm, uh, which then emits a signal to a smartphone, so that the smartphone app is able to record when the patient uh, took a medicine or not. So it is useful. It is just about uh, released, and uh, you know, still there is not a lot of experience with it. But the point is that across medicine, there are several other areas of medicine where these kinds of digital monitoring is being introduced. May have a role in addressing non-compliance, but we still need to get more experience. But this time, long-acting injectables are what are particularly helpful. And this is a complicated slide with the various uh, long-acting injectables that are available. Haloperidol and fluperidone are the conventional antipsychotics. Risperidone, paliperidone, and lanzapine are the, um, uh, are the atypical antipsychotics. Um, you will have all these slides, but I'll quickly skip to this one slide, which uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, places the four commonly used um, uh, atypical antipsychotic drugs in, in the one slide. Um, it's important to note that uh, two of them, namely paliperidone and the lanzapine, they both have the advantage of not requiring an oral supplementation during the switch from the oral medication to the injectable. And if you go to the next slide, um, this is, makes it even more clear. Uh, patients in whom there, are, there is a worry about weight gain and so on, um, you would want to avoid olanzapine and maybe risperidone because that has somewhat of a higher risk of weight gain, but the others might be better, the aripiprazole, sulfonazine, haloperidol might be better. Those in whom prolactin elevation is a worry, um, aripiprazole maintainer might, be, might have an advantage. Those who have, uh, where there is a need for a fast-acting agent, as I said before, aliperidone Sustena and uh, lanzapine might be better. Those in whom, um, you know, the number of inject injections per month is an issue, or you know, you want to give it kind of at a pace that the patient is willing to accept. Um, Flufenazine is every two weeks, and uh, risperidone consta is every two weeks. But the others are more like monthly or even once in two months, and so that would be an advantage for aripiprazole. Uh, lanzapine and paliperidol and haloperidol. Cost-wise, um, the conventional antipsychotics like flufenazine and haloperidol have an advantage, but the others are expensive. So my main um, uh, take-home points are that um, insight is multidimensional. Insight is strongly correlated with cognition and also strongly correlated with treatment compliance. Treatment non-compliance leads to relapses, and you know, it's important to intervene early to prevent relapses. Brain dysfunction and schizophrenia uh, might be related to the inability to be aware of the symptoms. It's called anosognosia. Um, so uh, it's important to, for the future to develop interventions that improve cognition, perhaps, which might improve treatment compliance and insight. Long-acting injectable antipsychotics are superior to oral antipsychotics in improving adherence and should be considered early. Many times we see patients getting the injectables like several years after their illness begins, uh, but more and more 
research is beginning to show that you, uh, introducing long-acting injectables early in the treatment of schizophrenia might be uh, useful. And as I said before, an approach to st approaches to adhere, address non-adherence must be individualized. And we went through six case scenarios. Those who refuse medications, those who are non-adherent because of side effects or lack of treatment, lack of efficacy, uh, those who don't show up for treatment, those who miss or forget to take their medicines, and those who don't accept their medications. And we need to evaluate the cause for non-adherence non in each individual and tailor our treatment specifically to the individual's goals and needs. And this slide summarizes all the points that I just mentioned using those case vignettes. So those are my um, slides. I'm going to take some questions. Um, has, um, so I can read through here uh, if there are any questions. Have you been monitoring? So um, maybe I'll have Rachel um, read those questions to me, and I can answer them as she reads them. So let's see here. So you want to read them? Okay, uh, great. So, uh, um, looks like people are typing. Right. Um, so, Hi, I Cash. Like it's Vanessa. So, there yeah. are some questions on the right of your screen, if you can see them. I posted them there. Diane had a question, as well as Lisa. Right. Uh, so, okay. I here have, see a question. On your four components of insight, a person maintains the top three but disagrees with the offered treatment and has legitimate reasons. Are you still considering them as non-adherent? Absolutely. Uh, well, legitimate reasons and the patient not um, accepting treatment is also non-adherence, but that's one cause. And there might be legitimate reasons, and the clinician's job would be to identify those legitimate reasons and address those reasons. So I would consider them non-adherent, uh, non but their treatment would be to minimize the reasons for, their, for the patients to be non-adherent. Uh, here is a question by Dr. Lisa Wyden. Uh, do you have the citation for the study compa comparing uh, compliance in medical and non-medical illness. Yes, I will find that uh, citation and send that to people. Um, are there any suggested procedures for improving medication compliance with the incompetent to proceed? Well, you know, I kind of alluded to this. Um, so first of all, one needs to ascertain um, the, the lack of competence to consent to treatment. And as I also said, uh, you know, even in those in whom we believe that they do not have the competence to um, appropriately consent to treatment, we should use the, all the conservative approaches to get them to accept treatment by uh, allying with the patient's family, with the other treatment team members, and offering education. And, and if everything else fails and the patient is not accepting treatment, um, one would have to get a second opinion um, and consider a involuntary administration of medication. Typically, something like that is, in, is done in the inpatient setting and should be done extremely uh, rarely. And um, in that, even when it has to be done, you know, some level of autonomy too should be given to the patient. So, for example, in my experience, I've seen that simply giving them the option whether you want to take it as an, as an oral or as an injection, uh, often in the majority, they agree to take it orally. Um, and even if it is an injection, giving, giving them an option as to where the injection would they prefer and so forth. So some level of autonomy is, is important. And of course, the other issue comes up is when they accept the treatment while on the inpatient, but when you uh, discharge them, there is no guarantee that they will accept the treatment. And so many states have this uh, ability to get a court order, 
like a Roger in Massachusetts, and uh, you know we uh, have a court, you know, uh, get the get a mandate for the patient to accept treatment um, as an outpatient for a certain length of time, and it's got to be renewed. Um, are there any? Uh, the, the next question is: What advice would you give for treating children and parents? Um, stop medication due to vacation, summer break, or they report behaviors not displayed at home? It's, a, it's an interesting, good question. Uh, treat, treat, uh, what advice for treating children and parents stop medication due to vacation? So one thing that has been uh, you know, found in the uh, treatment of seriously mentally ill populations is that giving treatment vacations is not a good idea. Typically what happens is when, uh, when there is a treatment holiday, they, they feel great for a few days, kind of honeymoon period, and then they relapse. And then they relapse, it is often very difficult to get them back stabilized. So um, when they go on vacation, it's important to advise them and all the caregivers of the, of the parents to have the medicines on hand and keep an eye on them taking the medication and when my patients go away on vacations to other states, I generally um, give them possible names of clinicians that they can contact in the need of emergency, or if they run out, call me so I can uh, send them prescriptions and so forth. So it's important not to um, break medication due to vacation or summer break. Um, that's my general uh, approach to this. So the next question here is, our experience in California is the difficulty of accessing long-acting medication due to insurance authorization. Um, what's your experience when, um, sorry, uh, okay, when facing this uh, barrier, barrier, insurance authorization? This is a, it's a major problem. Um, so it's always, it's always a question of uh, the clinician getting into arguments with the insurance, um, uh, the people who authorize, and convincing them of the importance of the prevention of relapse and the, the saving of costs um, that to the insurance uh, system by reducing the number of readmissions would largely uh, outweigh the cost of the injection medications. So it's a struggle. There are no easy or good answers to this. Um, and sometimes when the insurance has refused expensive atypical long-acting injections, um, we have had, they have gone back to conventional uh, long-acting agents like uh, monthly haloperidol injections and so forth. Hopefully that is uh, not a common approach because they have their side effects as well. But they can be managed with the appropriate dose adjustments and the side effect medications. I think we are coming closer to the end. It's about a minute left. I don't see any other questions. Um, so are there any things that Rachel, you or Vanessa want to say at the end? We have just about one minute left. Yep, um, as you can see on the slide, we have a few upcoming events, and please feel free to register if you're interested. Also, Dr. Keshavan will be doing a psychopharmacology consultation line August 22nd with Dr. Roscoe Brady with a specialization in bipolar disorders, so if you're interested, please feel free to sign up for that as well. And thank you all so much for attending today's webinar. Thank you.